My name is Bala Rajagopalan. I have my colleagues uh, Kiran Madnani out there, Neela standing next to him, and Mahesh here. Uh, we have uh, a complex demo logistics. You know, we need uh, different people here to do stuff. So let me just uh, begin by saying that you know, what we're going to talk about today. The fundamentally three things that you know, we will cover today. One is the capabilities that are delivering in System Center 2016. Second one is you know, how does System Center work with Windows Server 2016 to enable the software defined data center. A lot of investments have gone into Windows Server 2016 with uh, capabilities that are brand new. And you put System Center together with it, you can harness that and actually build a scaled out system. And that's basically what we want to talk about. The third thing is how System Center works with uh, OMS. There's a lot of excitement around OMS. And the key question is, what does it mean for me as a System Center customer? What do I do with it? How do I leverage that? And what is the journey that System Center is having right now? Right? We'll try to answer that question. So the agenda is along these lines. Now, we'll have some time for question and answers in the end, but I think you know, we have to do it uh, out here in the front as opposed to taking questions from the broad audience. Considering System Center 2016, just to give a, a broad background, it's a, a comprehensive suite of uh, management that provides all the way from capabilities from provisioning to self-service and service management, covering areas of configuration, monitoring, automation, backup, and recovery, which we call as protection. And you have specific components that provide these services, and we'll try to cover a broad perspective of what's coming in 2016. We probably won't go into a lot of detail into any particular element, and those will be covered in particular sessions that we have, which I'll provide references to. Right. Question is, you know, what can you do with uh, Systems Center 2016? There are three things you can do. One, you can manage your heterogeneous data center on-prem. And second, you can actually monitor your resources and services that you're running in a cloud, which could be you know, Azure or Amazon. And to a limited extent, do some VM management, you know, which is not really a, a great capability right now, but you can do that. And third thing, you can connect to OMS, and that's a part that I'll come to in the end, to get supplementary services and added value. And that's something of an evolving thing that's happening right now as you know, OMS uh, becomes uh, more popular. New in System Center 2016 are many capabilities, all the way from full SDDC support, which means supporting software-defined compute, storage, and networking. And assurance is a feature that allows you to protect VMs and have a, a safeguarded environment where VMs cannot be tampered with. And operations management, which has an extended footprint across both on-premises and in the cloud, with OMS attached and enhanced experiences and simplicity of usage. Data protection, which also has uh, more effective and efficient data backup that uh, will be covered here. And uh, PowerShell-based automation, service management with some improvements, and Config Manager, which has a number of innovations for continuous value. And that is primarily focused on the Config Manager side on the client devices, but uh, you know, there is also work on the server side. We will direct you to Config Manager sessions to cover you know, all the Config Manager features, but we'll cover the rest of it in this session. So when it comes to Windows Server 2016, there are innovations across compute, storage, networking, and security. And System Center supports every one of those features or will soon support. For example, on the compute side, you'll be able to provision nano server, monitor them, and back them up. Rolling upgrades for zero downtime, mixed mode low OS clusters. On the storage side, software-defined networking, provisioning, and monitoring. On the networking side, software-defined networking, which is coming for the first time with the network controller and provisioning of that and the network function virtualization that's coming in Windows Server 2016. And supporting guarded hosts and uh, shielded VMs is another feature of uh, uh, what uh, System Center is doing. And across all this, you'll find monitoring capabilities and automation that can work across all this. So if you look at 2016, it's essentially moving towards a completely software-defined world with Windows Server as the primary platform that System Center manages, although it's not the only one. On the Linux side, 
you can deploy and manage, configure, monitor, and backup Linux VMs, and in some cases, Linux hosts. And you can do automation across them. And just as a quick reference, what we support is in this table here, the Linux system that is supported by various components of System Center. VMware is an area that System Center also supports with the automation, DPM, operations manager, and VMM providing support, as listed here, right from managing VMs, conversion of VMs from VMware to Hyper-V, and monitoring hosts, uh, VMs, and other virtual functions in VMware environment, backing up VMware VMs through vCenter, and then doing automation with where VMware VMs are involved. So basically, you have coverage of uh, VMware and, uh, in System Center. And when it comes to Azure, you can do basic operations in terms of management, managing Azure VMs, but a lot of the functionality is in monitoring. Uh, System Center Operations Manager can use the public APIs provided by Azure and AWS to do monitoring of various services as listed here. So on the whole, this broad overview is to kind of convey the fact that you have a spectrum of things that System Center does, and a lot of the value is actually you know, focused both on Windows Server-based systems as well as in outside of Windows Server. Now let's come to specifically about data center management with System Center 2016. What are the things you can do and how, what we have implemented in this release? So just to recap, the data center management falls along all these buckets from provisioning to self-service with configuration, management, automation, so forth. And we look at each of these uh, components and see what we're delivering this time. And as I said, our coverage here is more on a broad perspective than on you know, deep dives into specific features. And we're also not, to go into, not going to go into Config Manager, which has got a lot of coverage elsewhere in Ignite. So let's look at VMM. So the, what VMM does for you is to take the platform capabilities that Windows Server delivers across compute, storage, networking, and assurance, and allows you to transform that into a usable, scalable, manageable system. And you know, VMM is our primary recommendation for you to manage Windows Server-based data servers, data centers, particularly in the 2016 release. On the compute side, you can do things like complete lifecycle management, including of nano servers, and live cluster update, manage software-defined networking um, and software-defined storage, um, the storage direct, and the quality of service, and various other features. On the networking side, you can deploy, configure, and manage SDN, without resorting to complex scripts or any of those things that make life hard. And you can provision and manage host guardian service and shielded VM services. So let's look at what nano server provisioning means. You can take a nano server, which is basically a small footprint installation option in Windows Server 2016. You can take bare metal and start installing nano server. You can actually start creating clusters with nano servers with VMM. It can be a storage cluster or a compute cluster, and you can do this at scale. So this is a new thing that's being supported in VMM in 2016. Cluster rolling upgrade is another feature whereby if you have a 2012 R2 system that's live, you can convert that to a 2016 system without any of the VMs getting impacted. VMM orchestrates this whole process by live migrating VMs from the machine that you're going to upgrade to other machines, doing a clean install of 2016, and then live migrating again VMs back to this. The beauty of all this is if you have backups scheduled, the scheduled backups don't get impacted because you're doing this transition from 2012 to 2016. Um, so DPM supports that. Storage Spaces Direct is another technology that's new in Windows Server 2016. This allows you to take industry standard servers with local storage, which are distributed across multiple machines, and create a storage pool from which storage can be allocated to VMs which are, top, which are on the top. So essentially, you can create an abstraction from physical storage that can be handled as one large pool and be allocated to VMs as volumes. And there are two types of S2D clusters that we support. 
One is called hyperconverged, where you have compute and storage in the same system, and it scales. Both of them scale together as you increase the as your demand increases. The other one is disaggregated, which is basically the compute and storage are separate, and you can scale them separately. So if you have smaller requirements, the hyperconverged is a good answer for you because it's more efficient in terms of cost. If you want flexibility, the um, disaggregated, disaggregated uh, configuration is better because you can scale independently on compute and storage. And VMM supports both of these options. Particularly in the case of hyperconverged cluster creation, it's just a matter of creating a VMM cluster, having a single check mark that enables S2D, and you have a hyperconverged cluster created in no time. And that's a demo that I'm going to do right now. Can you switch it? What you have here is a cluster with uh, three hosts. Each one has its own storage, and you can see you know, they have varying amounts of storage here. Let's go and create a Hyper-V cluster. Give a cluster name. Select it from that group that we saw. All you need to do is to do a tick here and specify the run as account. And which host you want to put in the cluster. Let's select all of them. And you need the IP address for communication here for the management side. And that's about it. And in this stage, if you finish, it's going to start creating the cluster. And that's a process that takes a few minutes. Let's just go to a place where the cluster is already created. Right? And once a cluster is there, you can start creating volumes here. Okay, if you look at uh, shared volumes, a number of them are already created. Let's just expand this. Yeah. Right, you can add a volume. Seven. Let's specify a size, let's say four GB. And you can see that normally the S2D can create cl these uh, clusters with multiple tiers, you know, up to two tiers. One is capacity, another one is performance. In this particular setup, we have only one tier configured for capacity, so everything is going to be in that tier. And then you can start creating the volume here. Again, that's also going to take some time, so I'm not going to engage in that right now. OK. So let's switch back to the presentation here. So as you, see, as you saw, creating a hyperconverged cluster creation is just a few steps. And it's no different from, you know, it's very similar to creating any other cluster with just a S2D enabled there with the check, with the check mark. Now, SDN is a brand new feature in 2016 Windows Server. In the sense, you know, we used to call what we had before as SDN, but really this time we have introduced a network controller that isolates the control plane and provides centralized network control. You can virtualize your entire network, and we have also introduced new network function virtualization, software load balancer, a distributed firewall, and then there is a NAT and, uh, and other functions to be developed. And all of this can be provisioned using VMM, and VMM can work with network controller to do this. And then there is also the physical infrastructure upon which the network virtualization is built. The network controller today doesn't actually do anything with the physical infrastructure. It doesn't control that. But VMM does have features that control the physical infrastructure also. So essentially, VMM today works with the REST APIs that the network controller provides on its northbound side and allows you to basically bring up your network uh, SDN infrastructure, including the provisioning of the network controller, provisioning of SLB, NAT, the gateway, and then what we call the network security groups or port tackles, essentially the firewall function, and also provisioning QoS. And you can provision on the physical infrastructure side, RDMA, switch embedded teaming, and uh, you know, NIC teaming, and so forth. 
These will be covered. Actually, if you are interested in knowing more about this, there's a specific session on deploying SDN in zero to 60 minutes. Uh, that reference I'll provide later. So VMM does all this. In addition, you have the tenants who are requesting virtual networks and functions on demand. We still support the WAP portal through which tenants can make the request, and VMM can take those requests and start provisioning your virtual networks through the network controller. So essentially, you have backward compatibility with what you used to do in 2012 R2, even if you deploy the 2016 infrastructure. And uh, VMM works with the current network controller to give you the SDN control. Now, shielded VMs is another feature we just talked about in the beginning, where you have VMs whose data cannot be tampered with even by the systems administrator who is administering the, the physical host. And even the access to the shielded VMs is limited. Unless you have credentials, you can't access the shielded VMs. So VMM allows you to create new shielded VMs or convert an existing VM into a shielded VM. We'll just look at how that happens. Six, right? Let's go back to the VMM console. All you need to do is to say, you know, create a virtual machine. You can use a template for creating shielded VMs, which is here. Give a name for the shielded VM. Probably one already there. You can just go ahead here. Let's click Hyper-V. Data center. The shielding data file is the one that has all the credentials that are used to manage the shielded VM. So this is actually built into the process where you create the shielded VM. So only the user with the credentials that are covered in this shielding data will be able to access the shielded VM. And we can place the shielded VM on this destination. And this gives you a recommendation on where you can place a shielded VM, actually, in that group. One of the things to note is that a shielded VM cannot be created in any host. It has to be a guarded host, which has the ability to host shielded VMs. And you automatically get a rating for various hosts, including those that actually are blanked out because they cannot support the placement of shielded VMs. So here, let's choose the one that is four stars and then go next. This doesn't matter. Right. At this point, it's ready to create the shielded VMs. You know, that's again takes some time, so let's just go back and look at the shielded VMs that are already created. Let's look at the one that's running. If you look at it and try to connect with it, first of all, you notice that you cannot connect through the console. It can only be connected via RDP, and at that point, you'll be asked for credentials to connect. You'll have a, a lot more deeper coverage of what uh, the shielded VM operations are in the VMM session, including when you try to mount a shielded VM, and when an operator try to, uh, an administrator tries to mount a shielded VM onto a host, he, he doesn't succeed unless he has the credentials. Let's just go back to the presentation again. So in summary, what VMM does provide is the ability for you to build a scaled out data center with Windows Server 2016 and manage it. You can build highly available storage at low cost by leveraging the storage spaces direct functionality. You can configure your network using software instead of hardware and without resorting to very complex scripts and using templates. And you can easily deploy applications, and you can leverage the enhanced security that Windows Server 2016 provides. And a lot more on VMM you can hear in the VMM session today at 4 o'clock. So the next part of this is monitoring the operations manager. 
So the, the one that complements your VMM on the provisioning side is the operations manager for the software-defined data center that is being provided by 2016 Windows Server. This goes all the way from fabric monitoring to monitoring applications and services. You can do all of this you know, as you were able to do before, but now it includes the nano server and other components that are part of the new Windows Server 2016 offering, including software defense storage. On the networking side, you can monitor SDN, and the new functionality is also called network performance monitoring, which doesn't give you not only just health, but also network characteristics like loss and latency that can be monitored in real time. On the OS and workload side, you can monitor various operating systems and workloads like SQL and applications, both through our native MPs for Microsoft applications as well as you know, third-party applications that can be monitored. So a lot of these things are carried forward from where they were before, but it now applies to the new environment of uh, SDDC. Let's take nano server monitoring. What you get as an experience from an experience perspective is exactly the same as monitoring a full-fledged host, except that we had to develop a new management pack from scratch because the nano footprint, particularly for the .NET core, is smaller than before. And you have to have a PowerShell-based MPs as opposed to VBScript-based MPs as before. So we had to develop MPs new for monitoring nano server. And the top layers of SCOM agents that you find today, which mainly have to deal with uh, discovery and application monitoring, are not there for the nano MP or nano agent. The reason for that is you know, the nano server is still evolving, and as we figure out you know, what the application hosting capabilities that it has, those things will also happen here. But today, we can support workloads like DNS, IIS, failover cluster, and of course, the base OS. And more will be coming as you know, new applications are hosted on nano server. On the storage side, what we have in Windows Server 2016 is a new health service that gives you discovery information, which is you know, the, the cluster components, the storage subsystem, and so forth, and also actions like insights and health information, which the operations monitor MP leverages to provide very detailed information in a new visual UI. So here you can see the various components of the layering of uh, the software space, the storage space is direct, where you have the physical infrastructure underneath upon which a cluster is built, and then a storage pool abstraction is built, and then volumes are you know, created, and then storage is allocated to file, file server shares and then VMs. OM monitors all of these components in terms of providing information about availability and health and performance metrics. We look at the S2D monitoring demo now, my should do it. All right. Um, audible? OK. So this is um, System Center Operation Manager 2016, um, reiterating what Bala just mentioned about various different components of storage space direct. Um, so uh, from a storage uh, you know, point of view, the, uh, if, you, if you look at the, the stack completely, you would be having the uh, you know, machines down on top of which you create a cluster on top of it. And then you're going to create volumes, and then the file shares, uh, you know, spun, uh, spun up on top of it. So we have exactly those components, uh, you know, listed down in this management pack from a health monitoring point of view. Uh, this is a dashboard view of uh, the new STD management pack, which has initially the subsystem. So you get to see all the clusters' health. So in case if there are any alerts, you get to see it over here. The, the CPU utilization reflects the overall stack's um, health from a utilization point of view. And then you get to see all the cluster shared volumes that has been created on top of. In this case, there are three cluster shared volumes created on that bit of four nodes, what we have. And then there are five file shares that has got created. At this point in time, all of them healthy, which is a great situation to be in. The volumes, specific health, um, the same. Uh, like how we have the storage subsystem, you get to see all other you know, two components over here. And that's structured that way. And you can. Dwell into each of these layers, for example, the storage subsystems. This is one cluster that is created right on top of the four nodes. And you get to see that, uh, the health of that. The volumes are here, which gives you, again, a uh, deeper sense of alerts for each of this. There are diagram view wherein you can click and get a sense of how that volume is 
um, you know, constructed what are the file shares that are built on top of that particular volume can be visualized. Similarly, um, in each of the layers, you can have the diagram view to get a good perspective of the health. For example, let me look at, show you the storage subsystem. If you look at the diagram view, that gives you the complete perspective of how the topology is stacked up. Uh, these are the volumes and the file shares. And you know, like the, the traditional uh, system center operation manager capability from the point of view of health in each of these different uh, component aggregating onto the next level uh, component, all that would continue to exist through the Health Explorer mechanism. Thank you, question. Five, was it? Three. So let's also look at the other features that are in SCOM in this release. What we call extensible network monitoring is something that you know, you've been asking for a long time. Today, if you have to monitor the health of a network device, the SCOM team, the SCOM product group has to start supporting it. Under extensible network monitoring, if you identify a device, you know, we provide a tool through which you know, if the MIBs are published, you can actually point to the MIBs, go and walk through the MIB, identify you know, what, sort of, uh, what kind of subsystems that you want to monitor in the device, create an OID, and you can start actually auto-generate an MP that can help you monitor that particular device. The exact process of how this works will be covered in the SCOM session later in the week. But the bottom line is you don't have to rely on us to deliver monitoring for particular devices. You can just go ahead and create the MPs that can monitor the devices that you're interested in the network. So basically, that's a, that's a big thing because now you know, this thing can scale. You know, we are not the bottlenecks in terms of uh, trying to support each and every device that's out there that you may be using on the network side. Likewise, monitoring for SDN, which is uh, a new functionality in this release, what it allows you to do is to have a consolidated view of the network elements, the virtual network elements, the load balancer, the firewall, and so forth, and virtual networks, all created by having a management pack sitting in the network controller and using the network controller APIs to gather information that the network controller has rich amount of information on all the systems it controls. And the MP leverages this information to provide a consolidated view of SDN monitoring. The new thing I mentioned also for SDN is network performance monitoring, which can be applied in a, a network that is part of SDN or outside of it. But that will give you performance characteristics. And we'll talk about it uh, more later. Right. So it's not all about new management packs and managing, expanding the managing, management surface. In this release, it's also about operational simplicity. That includes being able to discover and update the management packs that you already have, and trying to get a sense out of you know, how much of your system is being monitored or not. The second thing is alert noise reduction. You know, it's, it's one of the big problems that uh, you face when you're monitoring, where alerts are generated all the time, and many of them you may not be interested in, but yet they're generated and you have to deal with it. We have a feature that actually reduces the alert noise and allows you to configure intelligently what kind of alerts need to be generated that you need to look at. And that we will just show you uh, later in the session that uh, Mahesh will do on Thursday. And there is scheduled maintenance mode, whereby you can say that, look, between this period, systems are under scheduled maintenance, and a, you, you should not be you know, generating alerts and um, just keep quiet during the period. So that is supported, and you have in-place upgrade. On the fundamentals, we have scale improvements for Linux monitoring. It's twice of what we had before. And then we have performance improvements, which come out of the .NET upgrade that we have done to .NET 4.5 underneath. Improved UI responsiveness because of the new caching we have implemented. And we are removing all the Silverlight dependencies from the web console. Yeah. So I guess you know, that's something of a big ask. Right. So this HTML, HTML5 web console, I'm sorry that the picture is not uh, very clear, but it's just a, a kind of a placeholder to say that, yes, you know, that's happening. We'll have no silver dependencies when uh, we go out in GA. The HTML5-based dashboard views will be partially done, but we'll complete it soon after GA. And then be, the web console will be faster. 
and you'll be able to access it from different browsers. So let's come to MP discoverability. I mean, this is just a sampling of the capability that you know, we want to show you, actually. What this does is, if you have a managed system with all sorts of elements, you know, some of them are under SCOM monitoring, some of them may not be, you know, and some of the MPs may be there, and some of them may need updating. This is a way for you to automatically discover whether monitoring is comprehensively being applied in your system. It allows you to look at systems where MPs need to be downloaded or updated, and missing MPs that you may want to pick up. And this works by us maintaining a catalog of MPs and SCOM automatically applying the knowledge from that catalog to the system that it's monitoring and trying to show you the gaps. And that, you know, we'll demonstrate just now. Yeah. So just to set some context to leave uh, from the Bala left, right? So MP lifecycle management is a challenge in systems center operation manager. I mean, basically we, it's uh, any, given any environment, it's uh, difficult to identify the right kind of a management pack for the workloads that they have. That's one challenge. The second is that you have workloads which is getting monitored, but then you may not be having an idea of an updated version of the management pack, and you learn about it you know, in some kind of a web search or internet search. Uh, the third challenge is about you, know, you have management packs rolled out, but then you know, some of the management packs are partially rolled out. There are a lot of dependent management packs which are still not installed, and thereby you're stuck in a workload monitoring and stuff. So these are some of the challenges that we are trying to tackle with this MP. Uh, update and recommendation capability, right? So here is a view where you can get to see it's a new pivot uh, by name updates and recommendation in the administration tab of a system center operation manager 2016. And it li lists out all the set of workloads that has been monitored uh, by the, um, uh, that instance of a system center operation manager and gives you a perspective of, you know, which are the uh, workloads which is having an update, management pack update available. So you can select one of those and clearly look at the more information to figure out like what are the set of machines um, you know, that is required to be in updated with that particular management pack. You get a clear sense of the version of the management pack. Select that, and then you can click on the DLC page. This is the download uh, you know, center page, which gives you a sense of which is that corresponding management pack. You really don't have to go and stitch the dots there. Similarly, the view guide is going to give you a context of appropriate management pack versions guide information so that you can read about it before uh, you having to import. The other category of data that you get to see here is um, print server. So this is a workload um, you know, in this environment which has not been monitored by the system center operation manager, right? But for which there is a management pack that exists in the online catalog. And it's able to identify you that and suggest to you that, hey, would you be interested in monitor? And you can go about pretty much the same way wherein you want to know more information about how many machines has the print server. You can get to see that from the more information, right? This is the, uh, another scenario where you have partially installed. So you can get a clear sense of which are the management packs that were got inso installed and the others which are required to be installed for that to be monitored uh, in its completeness, right? So you get a clear sense on that. And, the experience is pretty straightforward. You can start from here, get the management pack, and it's going to connect to the online catalog. By the way, what we have done in the back end is also a very interesting thing that we have today you know, multiple online um, properties uh, where the management packs are hosted, right? And one is the download center, and another is the online catalog. And with this capability, what we have tried to do is that we have tried to synchronize both of this. And the system center operation manager always looks up the online catalog. And you really don't have to look at multiple of these different sources and stuff. So this is a capability that exists today for native management pack, which is all the Microsoft management pack. We plan to open it up even for the external management pack. There are a lot of partners having management pack. And we want to really get to there that there's a seamless setup experience, experience and there's a simplified you know, lifecycle management uh, uh, of management pack that can be achieved. Thank you. So this is, again, a summary of uh, what we have in uh, the operations manager. It doesn't list everything, but broadly, the categories of work that's, been, uh, that's being delivered. One is to extend the footprint and monitor diverse environment. 
the integrated network monitoring, which is uh, going to make your life very easy in terms of adding new devices as well as getting network performance information. The operational simplicity, as we talked about, in terms of uh, the discovering and authoring management packs, including, you know, we have the VSAE for Visual Studio 2015. And then data analytics. You can attach uh, from SCOM to OMS, which will cover at the very end of this presentation, the separate topic area, and do interesting things. So if you want uh, a deep dive into the OM capabilities, you can attend the session on Thursday in the same place here in Georgia Ballroom. I'll hand over to Kiran to talk about uh, automation and service management. Thank you. Thank you, Bala. So those are some pretty cool innovations as far as virtual machine management were concer was concerned, as well as monitoring your applications were concerned, and as well as some of the infrastructure improvements, HTML5-based console, as well as uh, uh, some of the updates and recommendations. But what about tying all the systems together, the IT systems together and, uh, with, with the business processes? That's where Service Manager comes in. So if you're not familiar with System Center Service Manager, what it allows you to do is take key idle functions, IT infrastructure functions, and implement them in your environment. Things like release management, change management, uh, reporting and insights, and incident management, and self-service, so that your tenant users can deploy um, the resources that they need without having to go through a long workflow process. Under the covers, what Service Manager implements is a CMDB that keeps all your configuration items, all your assets that are there, all the work items that are created against those assets. Um, you can allow, it allows users or, or admins to create a service catalog, workflows, templates, as well as create a data warehouse that helps you with reporting and insights. And most importantly, uh, Service Manager integrates with the, all the System Center products as well as Active Directory and third-party management tools. The glue that ties all of this together is the automation components that SMA, Service Management Automation and Orchestration, provides. So what can you do with SCO and SMA as, as these components are called? You can standardize processes, activities, tasks, and runbooks and put them together so that you remove the repetitive nature of these tasks and minimize errors. SCO and SMA also integrate with third-party tools so you can manage across a heterogeneous environment. In fact, SCO has over 100 intelligence packs uh, that are supported with System Center 2016. Furthermore, you can orchestrate across multiple systems in your environment. So if you have heterogeneous systems, be it your, your VMM, SCOM, or your third-party systems from BMC or HP or other vendors, you can create runbooks that will allow you to orchestrate across these different systems in your environment so that you're automating all of your infrastructure, reducing the repetitive nature of the task, reducing the human intervention, and the number of errors that, are, that result as, uh, due to that. Let's look at what's new in Automation and Service Manager 2016. Some of the key focus areas for 2016 were to extend the capabilities that we already have in orchestration, orchestrator and service management automation. So the key things that we've implemented, as shown on this slide, are a PowerShell IAC plugin for SMA, so you don't have to depend on Windows Azure Pack or App as it's known in order to author your run books. We've added native support for PowerShell 5, so you can implement your, uh, your run books in, in PowerShell scripts rather than having workflows. And this tremendously helps in terms of the performance as well as scalability of the run books itself. We've updated all of the integration packs, the, uh, including the Azure integration pack and the SharePoint integration pack. So all, your, all the integration packs that, you, that work with 2012 and 2012 R2 will continue to work with 2016 without any uh, you know, changes to them. On the service manager side, we have implemented a new HTML5-based self-service portal, which is snappy in terms of performance. It allows your tenants to go out and request for resources uh, using this portal, as well as look at KB articles and issues in the environment. And we'll demo that in a, in a little bit. We've added support for Link 2013, as well as Skype for Business, so to allow for collaboration across various teams. And we have significant performance in improvements in Service Manager. So let's take a look at what we've done as far as Service Manager performance improvements. Based on the testing we've done internally, as well as testing that our customers have done, 
during the preview, we've seen 10x improvement in terms of creating work items as well as a significant improvement in terms of the work item capacity itself. So you can run more than 45 work items per minute. In terms of the workflows and the console itself, there's 1.5x improvement. So it's, it's, uh, it's 50% faster than what you have at 2012R2. We've also improved the connectors as far as co configuration manager and ADR are concerned. So you can see um, in terms of configuration manager, the, the 60, up to 67% improvement in, in performance, and with Active Directory, it's up to 50% improvement. So overall, we've seen significant improvements in what you can do with Service Manager 2016 when you compare it to the prior version of Service Manager 2012 R2. So let's take a little bit, uh, take a look at uh, some of the functionality that we've delivered in Service Manager. Here I'm going to demo a, the functionality for the self-service portal with HTML5 along with the PowerShell IIC capability of, uh, uh, that, um, that's implemented in Service Manager automation. So here we have a tenant user who wants to provision some resources for herself and can request that through that self-service portal. The self-service portal also allows tenant users to raise incidents and manage the status of their requests as, as well as their incidents, which I'm not going to demo today, but I, I would highly encourage you to play with it yourself and deploy it in your environment. So take, let's take a look at the demo for service manager automation as well as service manager. So here we have the new HTML5 console for service manager, and I've pre-created a request to create a new VM. So when I click on that, I can see, create a new VM. I can specify the name. I'm going to specify the VM name as pink. That's my favorite color. Say 8 GB, number of CPU cores is 2. And I'm going to deploy, request a VM with Microsoft Windows 10. I can also schedule a backup against this VM, but I'm not going to do it for this, this request. Once I hit Submit, a request is created in order to provision that VM. When I look at my requests, I can see an active request out there to create a new VM. Now, let me go to the SMA portal, the ISC plugin that has where I've already created a runbook under the covers in order to provision the VM. So this is the new SMA ISC add-on that, that we are delivering with SMA 2016. Here I've created a PowerShell script that, that takes in machine name, OS, the number of CPU cores, and the memory um, in gigabytes, and provisions a new VM against that. So here are the different OSs that were supported in the dropdown. This command will create a new VHD for that VM, so the storage associated with VM and this command will create a new VM. And what I've done under the covers is taken this ISC or this runbook, and I have connected it using the connector orchestrator and SMA connector to SM, and allowed for execution of, uh, uh, of the request that was submitted by the tenant user. And I'm going to log into the VMM console out here, and see this request. It's, it's a little bit unresponsive right now. Oh, there it is. So it's creating a new VM called pink in the job status. And once that's completed in a couple of minutes, what one will see out here is that the VM has been already been provisioned under close status. So the previous VMs that I've created a, a few days ago uh, show up as closed in, in my service request. So there you see that the self-service portal in conjunction with, uh, with the capabilities um, of the Power, PowerShell ISC and the connector that we have between SM, orchestrator, and, and service management automation allow you to uh, create end-to-end -end workflows that tie up your infrastructure, your resources, and your tenant users. So just to summarize, in terms of the capabilities that we've delivered with Service Manager, we have a new HTML5 portal that I demoed. We have significant performance improvements in Service Manager itself, and we have added support for Link 2013 and Skype for Business. As far as service management automation is concerned, 
We've added a new PowerShell ISC plugin so you can author run books uh, in ISC. Um, we've added support for native PowerShell scripts and we've added support for PowerShell 5.0 so you can leverage the latest capabilities of PowerShell when you author your SMA run books. So I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague Neela to talk a little bit about the ne next component of System Center Data Protection Manager. Thank you, Kiran. Hello, everyone. So DPM can protect your various workloads like SQL, SharePoint, Exchange, whether they can be running on a physical machine, Hyper-V private cloud, or a VMware private cloud, or for that matter on Azure. It can back up to the local disk and then can send it to Azure for offsite backup or long-term retention needs. This helps you in back maintaining the, getting rid of your tapes on-prem and taking them to the Azure. DPM can also back up Hyper-V VMs so far. In three weeks back, we just announced a VMware VM backup that can back up without any installing any agent on the vCenter or ESXS server. Now let's quickly look at what is DPM 2016 is bringing up. Windows 2016 brought in a lot of new technologies like Bala mentioned, a lot of efficiencies like Spaces Direct and REFS cloning that will reduce your overall storage uh, cost as well as the improve the performance. DPM is leveraging these modern technologies like REFS cloning especially, and it is reducing the overall TCO. It can now do three times faster backup. It can, uh, it can, save, uh, perform it can save the storage by 50% and double the scale. Another important thing that we are bringing in is that if you have a, a SQL DB that needs to be backed up every 15 minutes, that need to be stored in a very high performance storage versus a VM that is backed up once a day that, needs to, that can be stored on a very low performance storage. DPM allows this to have this workload to be affiliated to a specific volume. By doing that, you can manage your storage much more efficiently. All of these things are going to reduce your overall storage and overall backup environment cost. On the production server side, Windows 2016 brought in huge set of say, changes and huge set of improvements for the private cloud environments and the storage. One of the important things that brought up was that Hyper-V introduced a new technology called resilient change tracking, which is natively tracking the changes as, as they happen, and so backup will be much more resilient. In, case, in certain cases like storage migration, DPM used to do the consistency check, which is a very painful process, we, we got rid of that with the RCT technology. Another thing is that as Bala demoed today, the Spaces Direct is a way to uh, reduce the overall storage cost. Your VMs can be stored on that into the Spaces Direct and DPM can automatically detect and protect them without any extra manual steps. The Bala again showed how to do the rolling cluster upgrade with the zero downtime. Continuing that tradition, DPM can detect and continue backup while this cluster is being upgraded without bringing the production environment. Last but not the least, when you have a uh, uh, when you have the uh, uh, setup upgrade to DPM 2016, you can actually do back, continue backup the data sources without rebooting the Hyper-V server or a SQL server that is on the production server side. Finally. We are bringing the DPM uh, backup for the VMware VMs. Again, it's going to be agentless backup, and that will take care of uh, uh, VMware environment as well. Now, what is modern DPM storage? So as I said, DPM is now leveraging technology like REFS cloning and the VHDX as its container so that it can, it can increase the size required as the production server increases its size. Let's say, for example, I have a SQL DB that, is, that has 10 blocks of storage, and when we back up, we'll, we'll create a VHDX, but REFS stores all those things in what is called a chunk store. It's, it's in a common location. Now, the VHDX file that we create will point to the chunk store, so data, data is in a common area. This file is just a pointer to that. Now, when I need to back up another time, all I do is I'll call what is called a clone. I'll just create a clone that will again show a pointer to all these location. Let's say, for example, the two blocks changed. One and two changed to one prime and two prime. All we do is we'll copy that one prime and two prime to the chunk store, and then this clone will point, make a pointer to that. By doing this, we are using the technology RFS cloning. We are doing what is called allocate on write. This means that instead of the copy on write, we are able to 
do backups three, three times faster doing, by leveraging this technology. So I have a demo that, you know, that, that will help you in understanding what are the improvements we brought in. If you look at it, I have a VM that is cloned to get, cloned exactly the same VM. I'm backing up using the legacy, legacy storage model versus the modern DPM storage and see how that whole storage consumption works. So if I'm bringing up a machine here, a demo machine here. So, as I said, I have two VMs. One is the Atlanta HR1 and then Atlanta HR2. Both are exactly the same VMs. I'm backing up using the legacy modern DP, legacy storage and I'm backing up with the modern DPM storage. If I look at the legacy storage technologies that I'm using, I can zoom out a little bit here. If you see it here, we are consuming about 90 GB of data, 90 GB of storage for the same VM. Now let's go back to what, what uh, new modern storage is doing. I'm able to consume only 61 GB. This is a huge savings when you're looking at hundreds and hundreds of terabytes of data, your storage consumption has completely gone down by uh, 50%, right? Now, let's go and look at the, uh, the, the other mechanism where we are actually letting you configure the SQL backup to a high performance storage. So let me go back to the uh, storage table here. This I'm clicking on the management tab here. If you see here, I have three volumes added to the DPM, and the last one is, is supposed to be storing only SQL databases. No other data sources should be backed up into that. This means that, that this, this particular volume has uh, a, coming out of a very performant storage like SAN, you know, NAS, and all of those technologies, and so we will store only that there. So now let's go and back up a SQL DB and see how it lands up into the protection, right? So I'm clicking on the protection tab. This is where we actually specify the protection intent to say, hey, DPM back up these SQL DBs into this, uh, uh, into this with this retention mechanism. So I'm selecting a server. SQL is a server, so I'm selecting server. I have a Atlanta DPM one. It has a bunch of uh, DBs as well. So for the sake of the demo, I am backing up a SQL instance here. That SQL instance has a bunch of DBs that are located in this and I selected all of them. Now I am backing up to the disk, and I'm backing up to the cloud. Now this is where I specify how many times, how, how many days I want to retain, how frequently do I want to back up. I leave it out to be default. Now DPM is calculating where to copy all of this data to what, what volumes it should be copied. As I showed you, I had three volumes on the, on the, as a DPM storage. Now, DPM automatically did in that these are the SQL DBs and they should go to the SQL volume. And that's how it's doing here. If you are familiar with the DPM, no more co-location, no more LDM limits, none of them are there. Now, let's say if I want, I don't want to do the SQL back, uh, SQL volume, but I want to put it in for various reasons. I want to put it in HRVMs. I can do that automatically. By doing this, you are actually changing the overall storage dynamics and you can start tracking them here. So if you're updating the storage to different locations, this gets updated automatically. By doing all of these technologies, one is uh, specifying the ability to specify certain data sources to certain volumes, REFS cloning, VHDX technologies, it's helping you to back up three times faster, 50% storage savings, and double the scale we can achieve that. Okay. Back to you, Bala. Okay. So now this is the last section here in this presentation. We'll talk about uh, SC2016 and OMS operations management suite. So we have System Center, which is giving you a comprehensive management, and then it has a breadth of coverage, deep integration, and a rich ecosystem of partners and integrators and solution providers that work on it. And you rely on it for you know, your day-to-day -day management. The OMS, the operations management suite, is coming up. It's very exciting because it provides rich analytics, the scale and agility and expansion that you can get in the cloud, and the operational simplicity of not having to install stuff on-prem, new services that you know, we keep delivering very frequently, and then it's got a reach from anywhere from multiple devices, even mobile devices. So the real question is, you know, how do you get the best of both and what do you do with them together, right? And that's what you know, we're gonna talk about just now. Before I go further, 
can I get a show of hands on you know how many in this audience are actually using OMS today for in some manner? Okay, that's and how many plan to use? Is there a much larger <laughs> cross section? Yes, good. So here are some of the things that we're trying to do. You know, basically the idea is to have the 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 nice characteristics of OMS as being available to system center wherever it's appropriate. So available now, today what you can do is basically you can leverage log analytics in OMS, you can connect your SCOM events and data from SCOM into log analytics and do a good bit of analysis uh, with using very powerful computing in the cloud. And the new service that we have is network performance monitoring. SCOM has always lagged behind in network monitoring. and the way that we are trying to remedy that is first, of course, we are natively increasing the capabilities of SCOM. I talked about the extensible network monitoring. The other way that we are trying to do is to hook up to OMS service, which is called Network Performance Monitoring, or NPM, which provides performance characteristics of the network. We'll show you now how SCOM can complement NPM and actually work together and actually give you much better troubleshooting than you can have either with NPM alone or SCOM alone. And SCOM assessment is a new service that is in private preview right now in OMS, which allows you to connect your SCOM system to OMS and collect data from SCOM on SCOM itself and give you a good insight into how the system is performing, what kind of update it might need, and you know parameters along multiple access to allow you to tune and troubleshoot your SCOM system. So in other words, you know, we give insights about SCOM itself in OMS that you can you know, manage your SCOM servers better. So these are things that are available now. We'll look at the last two in actual demos. You know, what, what does it look like? So network performance monitor is a service which allows you to do live monitoring of network performance, which is if you decide you, know, you are interested in certain endpoints and want to look at the loss and latency, today that's available, and tomorrow you can add jitter and other characteristics. This can give you a continuous update of what's going on and help you characterize and remediate issues in your network. So this works by downloading agents from OMS, installing them, which is like any other you know, OMS deployment. And these agents can be placed entirely within a data center or across or one in the cloud, one on-prem, doesn't matter. You know, they can be placed anywhere. What they do is they use active probing and active communication to figure out the subnets that they are connected to, the paths between them, and characterize the loss and latency along these paths. And, and this is completely agnostic of the actual network that you have, whatever devices it may have, it, it doesn't matter, it works on top of that. And doing this kind of measurements and a nice averaging that it is implemented, an intelligent averaging that reduces the updates, the results are uploaded to OMS, and there you can do analytics-driven monitoring, get rich visual analysis of historic trends and current trends and where you have issues, which paths are showing problems, and then you can have custom alert rules that alert the administrator about uh, various things that are happening, right? Now, what does integration of SCOM with NPM mean? One thing is, of course, you know, you can use SCOM to deploy the NPM agents, and that's very convenient, and that's what most customers want when they use uh, OMS. The second thing is SCOM itself has data on the network, particularly on the device health and the port health and so forth. The integration actually marries the two to look at path characteristics and then knowing the intermediate device health to accurately pinpoint where faults could be in your network. And that's what we're going to demo now. Sure. Yeah. So this is uh, the OMS portal. So I believe uh, many of you must be familiar with this uh, specific portal. Um, in the solutions gallery, there's a network performance monitor. I've gone here and have it installed. And it's, it's working in tandem with System Center Operation Manager for a specific environment. In this uh, demo scenario, what we have tried to do is that there are two nodes. And our intent is to monitor the network performance characteristics between those two nodes. Now, those no two nodes could be within a data center or even across data center. We have things validated wherein you know, customers can have it deployed on their private on-premise. Um, with AWS or Azure, and we end up monitoring the loss and latency. And we, uh, as Pala mentioned, this is, this is an investment which we have started. We have started with loss and latency, but then there are a lot more other performance characteristics which we'll start you know, measuring. For example, jitter and you know, route flaps and whatnot, right? So in this solution, 
what we'll try to uh, do in this, sorry, in this demo, what we'll try to do is that we'll quickly look at the topology and understand how the loss and latency is being measured, how it is indicated to the user, and what is the data points in the system center operation manager that can be tied together to have a very deterministic fault, you know, um, kind of uh, localizing the fault than very probabilistic nature of localizing the fault, right? So uh, this is how the landing page of the network performance monitor would look like. Um, we have two nodes, and the, the nodes actually goes and discovers all the subnetworks that it you know, belongs to. It also determines all the path that ex exists between those two nodes, right? And there could be multiple paths, especially if you're looking at a network which is a kind of a class network where redundancy is built in with your access and aggregate switch layers. All of that would be self-discovered, right? You really don't have to go and feed it. The path would be literally discovered and stuff. Now, here in this uh, scenario, we are looking at two nodes, and there's a loss between those two nodes. Um, so user is able to click on those nodes. He's able to clearly get a sense of how the, um, let me just try to reduce it here. Yeah. So for any time in day, where has been the you know, packet loss encountered and how the latency has been behaved, all that can be literally viewed. There's a view topology which gives you a clear sense of how the topology exists between those two nodes, right? This has been self-discovered. Now, what you get to see here are basically the hops, which are, um, you know, which the host has been connected to, right? So these are like your access switch or aggregate switch, and that's uh, connected to and the entire path is actually listed over here. So this is one side of a story where the network performance monitor solution in the OMS is able to go and determine the loss and latency between two nodes. I'm, I'm just referring here to two nodes. We have customers try this against more than 200 plus nodes for their large network and stuff. So, um, and that gives you a clear sense of uh, loss and latency from a live point of view, right? It's really not relying on some of the properties which resides in the device and then you're trying to query that and then determine that, hey, this is a loss and latency. This is live. You're literally trying to do a TCP ping transaction and do that. So, let me show you another setup where this COM does a deep network device monitoring, right? We all know that um, in this case, uh, with the 2016, now System Center Operation Manager 2016 can go and monitor any SNMP-based uh, network devices. It's not just about the certified devices what we publish. User can go and extend it by, you know, by adding in the appropriate SNMP MIB and compiling the management pack and stuff. So in this scenario, we have a device which is not currently monitored by the System Center 2012 R2. So this is the Cisco 3172 PQTQ uh, you know, series of switches, which is used heavily for private cloud data centers. And that's something which we have tried to you know, have it imported. Uh, the MIPS are imported, and then a management, pack is uh, management pack is created, and we are monitoring it and stuff. So here, uh, another improvement what we have done is whenever you encounter a fault, right, this could be either by listening through an SNMP trap or even SCOM trying to do an SNMP get on that particular device and determining the health. In all those uh, you know, aspects, what we have added here is the contextual information um, to those alerts, right? It, can, it will give you clearly what is the interface IP address, what is the device IP address as part of that alert itself so that you can literally have it consumed as part of your log analytics search or any diagnostic story that you're trying to build. So here you can see this alert, which is on a specific port is, you know, for a specific device address. And then the interface address is 192.150.2.1. Now, if you would have mapped it against the network performance monitor topology, you would have known that, hey, this is the hop which is actually having an issue over there. And let's see how the search can be uh, in the log analytics search. So I'm going to the log and search over here. So this is going to give you all the network monitoring related data, including the path information of each of uh, the path that has been discovered over there and stuff. And you get to see all the uh, value. 
Now to this, we are going to add the system center operation manager data. Right? So, oops. Yeah. Looks like that data is not here. I'm sorry. So what would happen is basically all that alert information what we saw, let me try one, one more time. The alert information that's there from the system center operation manager would have reached the ops. Uh, log analytics and which would start showing up over here and then you could connect the dots with those particular uh, events over here and stuff. Um, I'll just try this out. Bala, you could just yeah. step onto it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's okay. I, the, the main point is that you, you saw the topology view. I think if the alerts are also incorporated from SCOM, you'd be able to precisely say, okay, these are the ports that are faulty and you can basically pinpoint why you're getting the latency or loss that you're seeing by combining this COM information with, with, uh, with OMS. So that's one part of it. The, okay, so let's look at SCOM assessment, right? SCOM assessment, like I said, you know, it provides you a way to audit your SCOM environment for better performance as well as, you know, better configuration and troubleshooting issues, right? Sorry, my machine is, okay. OK, so can you switch it, please? This. So essentially, this, you can actually you know, st start using this by connecting SCOM to OMS, which itself is a fairly simple process. You know, if you go to the SCOM console, you can see the operations it management works. suite you know, uh, tab on the, on the left. And then you can actually register to the operations management suite if you have already created an account. It's, it's fairly straightforward. It's just a, a simple way of connecting your SCOM um, uh, to SCOM management server to OMS, right? Now, after having done that, what happens is you subscribe to the SCOM assessment service, which downloads an intelligence pack and starts gathering information uh, from the SCOM management servers. Even if you have a group, you need to do it only in one management server and start providing you with recommendations. So essentially, at the end of it, you start seeing along four dimensions. One is availability and business continuity, performance, upgrade migration and operations, and then monitoring. And you have, for each diagnosed, and it runs about, we have about, uh, right now, about 60 tests or so. So it, uh, I mean, 60 rules or so to you know, apply on the tests that are run on the parameters that you get from these comp server. And it gives you an assessment. And then there are recommendations that follow these assessment with weights. The weights are based on the probability that the issue can arise and what kind of impact it might have and how easy it is to fix. And it's a combination of things that come up with a single number. And higher the number, more you should worry about it and it comes on the top. And then by clicking on it, you can also get a detailed set of steps that you can take to fix an issue. Precise things that you need to do and then you know what it means. So essentially what, and this is just an example of you know, how you can combine the power of uh, what can run in the cloud in terms of continuous updation of those rules and the collected knowledge from the service engineers on what could be going wrong if certain things are not the way it should look in this comm server. So this kind of support is essentially you know, available before through a lot of you know, manual interaction with premier service and so forth. But uh, you, know, you can get a, a good sense of you know, do-it-yourself kind of uh, you know, uh, assessment by just leveraging service. You can imagine the similar thing being available for VMM and other components of uh, System Center, and just shows you know, one way that we can marry you know, OMS and uh, uh, System Center. Let me just go back to the presentation. Then we can just, yeah. Right. So this, 
No, it's went off. Okay, sorry. So this is a, a one slide summary of uh, you know everything that's coming up in System Center 2016. This is not to be read here, but you know it's a reference, which just shows that you know, a lot of investments have gone in, and you know in many areas, particularly in enabling you know Windows Software Defined Data Center with Windows Server 2016, and a lot on monitoring. So and those things you know you will see in in, in other sessions. So the the question is you know what's next, really? I think you know that's basically in the top of the mind for most of the system center customers. And the challenge that we have in the system center world is, you know, number one, you know, we want to continue making sure that you can rely on the product for your business critical and mission critical applications and management. At the same time, we want to go towards modernizing the experience, providing new capabilities, and also, you know, giving you scale and performance that you need, right? And Clearly, you know, the direction that we are heading on one side is to have capabilities running in the cloud. And as I showed, where it makes sense, you know, we would like to deliver you know, these kind of hybrid scenarios where you have things that you can marry from you know, the rich analytics that you can provide in the cloud, which we are definitely not going to replicate on-prem in, in, you know, in the product again. Uh, and then you know, those things that are naturally fitting will be happening. At the same time, you know, we'll continue delivering features at a a cadence which is likely to be you know much faster than before you know we are looking at you know ur cadence to in fact you know give you the f the features that we are not completely covered in ga will be coming pretty soon after that so we are not going to wait for a long time to deliver new features on the system set aside so those are some of the things that we are looking at but on the whole the whole strategy of how system center and oms work together and how they'll be you know combined to deliver you know the experiences that you need is basically work in progress, and you know we are basic, you know, trying to um, do things that make sense in the current context of what customers need and the capabilities that we already have. You know, we'll be happy to take questions. You know, I think it's best we talk uh, out here, you know, as opposed to this, you know, big room. I think they have only two microphones, so we'll be here to answer any questions and uh, just, you know, to. Uh, reiterate what we said here is here in this slide, and I already mentioned that we have hands-on lab for system center and operations management suit. Uh, you know, in, in in many sessions there, and these are the related sessions which uh, you can look at. And actually, you can attend the VMM and OM sessions for more detail. There's also a number of config manager sessions, and then there is an SDN session and software defined data center um, uh, session, which covers the compute, storage, and networking. And this I'm supposed to put up for your reference. And finally, be well. So thank you so much for attending, and we'd love to talk to you.